Grace, mercy, and peace are yours in abundance from God our Lord and Savior, Christ Jesus. Our text for our meditation this morning is taken from Paul's letter to the Ephesian Christians. Chapter 4, verses 30 through chapter 5, verse 2. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So far, text. Dear Christian friends, it's going to happen if it hasn't happened to you just yet. The dreaded cell phone screen crack. I have had interesting conversations with my little brother who swears that he never drops his phone. I don't know if I believe, Phil, but I drop my phone all the time, so it doesn't matter if someone can actually go through life and never drop their phone. I can't. Before I do anything with the phone, I put a case on it and a screen protector on it because I assume that as soon as I touch it, it will fall to the ground. And I will break it. Now, <clears throat> phones are pretty easy, but I want you to understand that just like a cracked cell phone, Every time we sin, we break a little bit on the inside. Every time we rebel against our God willfully and go against His holy law, something breaks. And today we're going to talk about how our God is fixing the broken from spirit-grieving sinners to dearly loved children. This letter to the book of Ephesians, or this letter to the church in Ephesus, is kind of an interesting one. Some people think that it is a general one. The big pink blob in the middle is Asia Minor. That is modern-day Turkey. That was a center of Christianity in the ancient world. And when you read the rest of Paul's letters, oftentimes there's a very specific problem. He names names, does not pull punches. Corinth was a complete dumpster fire of a church. Incense... Incense. Incest. You had people taking other people to court. It was ugly. And Paul addresses it directly. Galatia, they had their own problems as well. But this letter to, to the Ephesians is general. He talks about the nature of how we worship God, how we function as a Christian, Christian church. And then in the second half, he talks about our life and what we're supposed to act like when it comes to Christians. And there are many people who think that this is a general letter to the, all of the churches in Asia Minor. There are seven or eight of them. And maybe also to us. This is some fantastic advice. All of the Bible is useful for correction, rebuking, and training in righteousness. But this letter might be some really good general advice for us. So it is worthy of our time. I want to go to the next slide, Christian. You'll have to help me out there, brother. And take it off. Well, we'll just keep on going as Christian. There we go. All right. Well, <clears throat> before we go into it, I know that this can be kind of a touchy subject. Because depending on what you came from and where your background was, we can all uh, rate ourselves as to how broken we are. That's not what we're trying to do. It doesn't matter, frankly. I don't care if you are so broken that you've lost every ounce of relationship in your life and you've hit rock bottom. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you have just scratched the surface on your cell phone screen of life and your soul is spotless. Everyone will go into heaven limping because everyone goes through this life touched by sin. And we're going to talk about how our God fixes it, but to start... We're going to spend some time about grieving and the Holy Spirit. And this is not a pretty picture, but this is where we're at. Verse 30, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. How exactly do you grieve the Spirit? Well, God's Spirit lives in you. The Bible says that you are a temple of the Holy Spirit. And every time you sin, this grieves, or you could say makes sad, your God. 
Now, you could take that too far and say every time you sin, God gets sad, and every time you do something right, God gets happy, and it's this wild roller coaster of emotions that comes along. That's not accurate. You stand in faith, Paul writes to the Christians in Rome. God loves you in spite of your sin. He does not treat you as your sins deserve. And yet there is a very real danger, Christian, that talks about repeated sin can separate you from your God. And you can grieve the Spirit. Now, throughout this whole section, Paul weaves in the Gospel. And this first chunk is a beauty. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. I want to show you this picture. I don't know if you can really tell what's going on there. That is a cowboy in the classical sense and he is putting a hot iron onto a cattle or a cow or some form of animal. This is animal husbandry at its finest. Do you know what he's doing? He is branding that animal. And this is for the animal's protection and safety because that rancher is putting his seal on that animal. So if somebody tries to steal it, if somebody tries to resell it, he can't. Because that belongs to that rancher. And you can't take away that scar, that brand. God does the exact same thing with you. It does not involve hot irons. It is not painful. It involves a washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. I'm talking about baptism. He seals you for the day of redemption through those waters. And he washes you clean, Christian. And on the last day, I know that there's been some talk as to the mark of the beast, and some people kind of go all over the place with conspiracy theories. It's very simple and beautiful. God knows who his Christians are. And he can see if you were baptized or not. It is his pledge. The Spirit is the deposit that one day you will be his until the last day when it is known publicly to everyone. And it is beautiful to see that. We go on. Verse 31, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, and slander along with every form of malice. There are all kinds of lists of sin in the New Testament. This one is talking about, in general, conversation. And I, there are some problems in churches, but I want to kind of point out that there's no fistfights at Sarah Bethlehem Lutheran Church after worship on a Sunday morning. It just doesn't happen. We don't have running gun battles in the parking lot. We're a pretty tame group here. And yet, I don't think that we're immune, we are immune from sin by any means. I got to go to my, my kid's open house. This is actually one of the different ones. I didn't have a picture of the high school open house. But it was fantastic. The current COVID rules at this school of 1,000 kids is if you wear a mask, you can go anywhere inside and there's no social distancing. You can just cram together. Outside, you don't need to wear a mask. You're just wide open. Well, you were in this big group, and for the first time in a year and a half almost, you saw kids clumped together talking. And it was really cool. They really enjoyed seeing each other. I think that kids need that. I think all of us need that interaction. Well, what goes along with small children and clumps of children? Well, there might be some gossip. There might be some slander going on. There might be some new friendships formed. All of those things. And I bring this up in a school because it's a nice arm-length example of what can happen at a church. Because that can happen. I'm not saying that it does. And again, small churches have small problems. And I don't know of any, frankly, at Star Bethlehem Lutheran Church. And I praise my God for it. But I would be naive if I said that that would never happen. <laughs> That's ridiculous. And so please take Paul's advice and guard yourselves wherever you go in life against this bitterness that can grow in your heart. Rage and anger, brawling and slander, all of those things. Be careful. Because you can fall into that trap. Don't. There's no reason. It's not helpful. Well, let's look at the next... Oh, I see. hang on one second. We need to talk about exactly how we get there. Because we are fixing the broken, and we go from spirit-grieving sinners to dearly loved children. What do you do with that sin once it happens? Well, we get a blueprint in Matthew 18. If your brother sins against you, 
or sister. Go and show him his fault, just between the two of you. That right there, that one-on-one, -on -one, you don't need to tell me, I don't want to know, you don't need to tell anybody else, just that one-on-one, -on -one, you going to the other person, nips in the bud so many problems. Paul has advice, just go back a couple verses in our text, and you're at verses 26 and 27. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. That's good advice for a marriage, for any relationship. Now, I know that every marriage is a little bit different, and sometimes you can have a conversation far more easily after a good night's sleep than you can when you're exhausted and bitter. But just understand, don't let that happen. I've had couples in my office who <laughs> haven't talked to each other in a year. They've just been existing. Don't. Right away. Deal with that sin or else it can grow out of control. And Paul has some fantastic advice here. This is verse 32. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Those words, be kind and compassionate, are a beautiful translation of the original Greek. But do you remember how the King James handles this verse? I don't do this much, but it just works so beautifully. And be ye kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. That concept of being tender-hearted is right there in compassionate. But tender-hearted is so vivid. If you looked at that sign in the middle of COVID, because McDonald's is offering signing bonuses for employees because they can't get enough workers, this is what can happen. And the tender-hearted Christian is the one who says, oh my goodness, why did they all quit? What interpersonal problem, what crisis happened in that restaurant that made people just walk away? I know that the reaction so often after you watch TikTok, you watch Snapchat, you watch Facebook, and so many of these fail videos, it can make you callous. Don't. Be tender-hearted. Be kind and compassionate so that your heart bleeds a little when you see something wrong. Because, my friends, God fixes the broken through you. Leave yourself room for that opportunity where you can find what's broken and fix it. Because the fact of the matter is, that divine love forgiving each other just as in Christ, God forgave you. That love isn't just a nice card that you give to somebody. This is an action. God so loved the world that he did something. He died. He died that you might live and be forgiven. And now, verse 5, sorry, chapter 5, verse 1, be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved Children, do you know what that is? This is going to be terrible, but... Yeah, if you're a mime, you're forever in a box. I don't know why, but the point is, a mime, originally, you were trying to imitate somebody. You'd follow someone around, and you wouldn't say anything, but you just kind of mimic their action. And it could be kind of a comedy routine, that's fine. But the Greek word there is about being mimicking God. You're an imitator of God. This is who you are, Christian. And so what exactly does that look like? Well, I've talked about everybody else, but I think before we start talking about everybody else, you need to talk about your own brokenness. You need to own that. And not be afraid to look in the mirror of God's law and see how desperate you are for God's love and grace. And to see that it's okay to be broken because you can't fix that. When God fixes something, He fixes it completely. When He told someone to stand up and walk, He didn't say, let me help you a little bit. They jumped up and started sprinting. It's complete and it's perfect. So when God says to you, be forgiven, you are forgiven completely. Your soul is not Etched with scars, it is completely whole and alive. 
Yes, you will bear those scars in your body, in your life. There are consequences for sin. I know. But between you and your God, you are completely new, a new creation. That's where you start. And that brings us to our final picture. And it's so powerful and vivid. And life, and live a life of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. We don't do a whole lot of sacrifices anymore. Not exactly. Not in a strictly Old Testament sense. Paul talks about how your life is one giant sacrifice, though. You are a living sacrifice. Do you know what that is? That is a candle warmer. Those have been banned across all state school dorm rooms. My um, newly graduated App State son was an RA, and those were the bane of his existence because you'd walk in and it's, it's actually a hot plate. Nothing's going to get burned down, but the state of North Carolina has said that they are not allowed in any dorm rooms. So he would have to go in and be the melting wax police and pull those out. But until this conversation I had with him this week, I never knew what that aisle was in Walmart. When you walk down and you see all those little squares, oh my goodness. Those are all different ways to get... The whole point of it is you put those in the little melter thing and then the fragrance comes off and it smells and it fills the whole house with pumpkin, with peach, with the scent of a pasture. I don't know. They probably have every kind of cube you could want, right? Well, the question I ask you is, what do you smell like? What do you smell like? The picture is one, so what happened? God would have the stench of sin in his nostrils in the Old Testament. And God's people, at every morning and evening, would offer a sacrifice to God. And the picture was that one day, the ultimate sacrifice, the Lamb of God, Jesus, would come and wipe that away. And that smell would smell of life and forgiveness. It's a very vivid form of worship. We don't do that. But I get it. And Paul says, live a life of love. Just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering. And a sacrifice to God. I know you guys look good, Christian. We've talked about your behavior and performance. But do you understand how you smell? And how your God thinks of you? And breathes in deep. Because you smell like life. Now, I don't know what that cube would look like or how I would market that. And I don't think it would really work to put it in just the candle warmer to get it across. But dear friends, that's what it's like and that's what your life will be like as you go through fixing the broken. There are people who grieve the Spirit by their behavior. Don't be like that. You, my friends, are dearly loved children who can help fix the broken. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. We now confess our Christian faith using the words of the